Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Francesca Guerrero. I'm a partner in Thompson Hines International Trade Practice. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar on avoiding forced labor in international supply chains. I'm delighted to introduce you to our panelists. First is Scott Young, a partner in Thompson Hines Labor and Employment Practice. Next is Lisa Gelsomino, who is the president and CEO at Avalon Risk Management and a member of the Customs and Border Protection Commercial Customs Operations Advisory Committee, including the Subcommittee on Forced Labor. And finally, Gabriella Herzog, who is Vice President Corporate of Corporate Responsibility and Labor Affairs at the United States Council for International Business. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. Today's program is being recorded and we will send a link to all attendees within 48 hours of today's presentation. We will be offering CLE for today's webinar. Please be sure to fill out and return the webinar affirmation form that can be found in the handout section of the control panel located on the right hand side of your screen. The form provides instructions as to where to send the completed form. I will announce the tracking code at the end of the program. In the handout panel, panel, you can also download a copy of the PowerPoint slides, as well as the bios of today's speakers. Again, thank you for your interest, and we'll get started. Thank you so much. Okay. Here's our panelists, and starting off our discussion today will be Gabriella. Thanks so much, Francesca, and thank you to everyone for joining today. I'm gonna kick us off Kind of at the macro level, I'm going to talk, I mean, today's focus is about forced labor. And forced labor definitions and policies really come um, from the global level at the International Labor Organization. To help frame that, I'm going to help you understand a little bit about USCID and, and how we fit into that discussion. So the U.S. Council for International Business, we're an employer association um, founded in 1945, around the time when the UN was starting. Uh, we have around 300 members that are active. We focus on policy engagement, but we focus on policy engagement at the global level. Um, we are the U.S. affiliate of three global employer associations who have unique standing at three multilateral organizations where these discussions about global labor policy, forced labor policy, human rights policy take place. And they have unique standing and we do as well through that relationship. In particular, I'm gonna be focusing today on the International Labor Organization. It's this, um, it's in the, uh, it's uh, here in the graphic on the side that kind of explains um, it kind of explains the how USCID fits in. We're the US affiliate to the International Organization of Employers. And they have the standing at the ILO uh, to represent employers there. So what is the ILO, you might be wondering? It's a, a unique body of the United Nations. Um, it's a labor-focused body. It was formed 100 years ago, and it was formed around the time that World War II was ending. And world was focused on reconstruction and they understood the key role that business and governments and workers played and they understood that we needed to have some consistency some common understandings about core ways of doing work around the world and so the ILO was formed and the key unique function of the ILO is setting legally binding international labor standards that happens every summer at something called the International Labor Conference, which is kind of the first bucket there in the graphic. It's a very big meeting, 6,000 constituents come. Constituents are governments who are member states of the ILO, and there's 187 employers like USCIB. We, because of our affiliation uh, that I mentioned previously, we are the US employer sitting at the table at the ILO in these discussions and negotiations. And then also workers are represented. Um, so uh, these, these issues like forced labor get discussed, um, prioritized, and legally binding standards are negotiated and then issued. Um, 
there's a um, governing body um, at the ILO, which is like the executive branch. USCIB sits on the governing body. And then there's the office secretariat, which is like the civil service of the ILO. And their job in particular is to help um, supervise the standards, do program technical assistance programs, but also research. And it's authoritative research. And the ILO is the global UN organization that does research every year on what is the size and scope of forced labor. I put in a hyperlink here for you. Um, their most recent report was issued in 2017, where um, concernedly for all of us um, focused on this issue, they found over 25 million people are in forced labor worldwide. And um, of that, one of four are children. So it's a pervasive and terrible uh, practice, which all of us on this call and beyond are focused on working to figure out how to address. Just go to the next slide. Thank you. So, um, so ILO in 1930 um, issued, uh, ratified the constituents agreed and issued the 1930 Forced Labor Convention, Convention Number 29. There have been 190 conventions issued by the ILO as of uh, last summer. This was number 29, very important, and it created the definition which is globally used. The defined forced labor is all work or service which is extracted from any person under the menace of penalty and for which the said person has not offered themselves voluntarily. Keep in mind this definition was issued in 1930 with challenges of those days. Over the years, the understanding and the different modalities of forced labor unfortunately have evolved and we have new terms and terms that are in use Day, like modern slavery or bonded labor, or human trafficking, etc. Because over time things have evolved, the ILO constituents in 2014 came together to issue a protocol to kind of build on that original and long-standing um, convention. The protocol, the aim of the protocol is to give specific guidance on effective measures that governments, employers and workers can be taking regarding prevention, protection and remedy in order to eliminate forced labor. One more thing I wanna say about the definition is while this is the global definition for forced labor, as I've described, um, things have evolved um, and the practice has evolved over the years. And as we're going to see in different examples of modern day regulation, it's very important to look at the details of how it's described in each one of those individual instruments. And you'll hear some examples of those today. I just wanted to include on this slide to note, if you're looking for more information about what forced labor is, there are some very helpful resources from the ILO um, listed here, um, like the, their 11 indicators of forced labor document. There's also a global business network on forced labor, which companies can join, USCIB is a member, associations can join, law firms can join, and I would encourage you to take a look at that link. Um, and then this, our government, US government, has resources like the State Department or the Department of Labor. Um, in particular, these Department of Labor reports, the Child and Forced Labor reports, show and can help you as you carry out your due diligence understand where are some of these practices and how are they taking place and there's a comply chain tool as well some online apps from the department of labor that offer um, support for for businesses moving on and conscious of time um, the main uh, message here i want to say so we've we've understood a bit about what forced labor is and we've taken some taken um, note of some resources so how does this link with business? Um, the expectations for business always are evolving, uh, societal expectations, and um, about the role that business can play positively or with challenges um, in society. Business does recognize that a lot of the causes of forced labor are deep-rooted, um, linked to um, endemic things like poverty, and they really require force, uh, they really require collective action, business, government, civil society organizations working together. 
Nevertheless, there are many examples of new regulations related to forced labor and expectations for business. And we'll get through some of those today. And um, just to emphasize, business is very much committed to, to supporting the global fight to address forced labor and working together with key stakeholders for success. Next slide, please. So we just want to talk a little bit about some examples of how these expectations on forced labor um, are manifesting into different um, uh, legal requirements for business. This is only a selected example. Um, we actually, um, and those of you who, who follow these issues, you know, um, there are a lot of examples around the world of, um, of, um, I'm so sorry. Um, I don't know if you hear that, but I do as well. Um, uh, there are a number of examples of regulation. So, in selected examples here, for example, um, the Dodd Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act included um, expectations for supply chain due diligence related to conflict minerals. Um, California Supply Chain Transparency Act, we'll hear about that. Um, 2015 UK Modern Slavery Act requirements for due diligence for companies. We're going to hear a lot today about changes to our customs law in the US in 2015 with expectations of due diligence for importers. EU has a non financial reporting law. Australia Modern Slavery Act as well. Dutch, the, in the Netherlands, they have a special law that was passed specific to child labor due diligence. And more is on the horizon, in particular at the EU level. Um, so let me just give you an example of what one of these laws looks like on the next slide. This will be my last slide. Um, the Australia Modern Slavery Act um, came into force in 2019. This followed um, the model that was seen with the UK Modern Slavery Act, but in Australia, legislators and stakeholders wanted to really build and expand beyond the UK. So this applies to companies based or operating in Australia um, with a certain threshold um, annual revenue over 100 million. And if you're in scope, it, it creates an annual reporting requirement for you that needs to be public on your website um, sub and submitted to the government for um, a, a public register as well. And it needs to include examples of how you as a company are taking a look, understand, um, your operations, where there may be risk of modern slavery, and then reporting to the Australian government publicly on what it is that you're doing about any uh, risks you may have identified. As of now, there's no penalty for non-compliance, but there will be, the act will be reviewed every three years, and there's an expectation that if they don't determine through some analysis that uh, enough progress is being made, um, it may um, Get revised and 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 tightened. That I'd like to turn to my colleague Francesca, who's going to give another example, and I look forward to um, the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriella. And um, we will spend a lot of time in our presentation focusing on U.S. laws, including in particular customs laws that um, impact forced labor. But I think it's very important to keep in mind that this is a global initiative. Companies, you know, are, are either have global operations or they have global supply chains. So you really need to keep the big picture in mind and all of these different acts. And really, as we'll discuss later when we talk about building your compliance program, work to the most um, broad and strict requirements. <laughs> so, um, but talking about the United States a little bit. Um, we saw earlier this year, in the summer, we saw a um, supply chain business advisory issued by Departments of State, Commerce, Homeland Security, and Treasury on supply chain risk its exposure in the Xinjiang um, province. These are concerns related to forced labor and other abuses against Uyghurs and um, perhaps other persons in this area under the guise of vocational training. Um, I wanted to highlight this because they did a great job of putting in this advisory all of the different types of liability and risk you might face around this issue. Um, one, one area is that 
if you are exporting something to persons involved in these activities, you might um, face problems with your export con with your export licensing because um, the the companies are listed on human rights um, are, are, are listed on the entity list for human rights reasons. Um, there are CBP prohibitions on imports benefiting from forced labor, and we saw the um, apparel industry really hit by this in Gen Xinjiang in particular, and Lisa will talk about this in detail. There are FAR provisions that impact um, government contractors and government subcontractors that prohibit um, use of forced labor and can lead to penalties. There are penalties under the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, um, and then there are various authorities that allow companies to be sanctioned if they are connected with um, this forced labor activity. So the advisory was kind of a good synopsis of a lot of different laws. And then almost immediately we saw this being implemented when there were 50 Chinese entities put on the entity list because of connections to human rights abuses um, against the Uyghurs um, and Kazakh minorities. We saw um, a lot of the same entities and other entities added to sanctions lists by OFAC, which would impact the ability to conduct any transactions. And I guess I should back up and just make it clear that the entity list prohibits the export of US goods, software, or technology, whereas OFAC sanctions lists usually prohibit companies from carrying out any transactions with these listed companies. We've also seen companies sued in recent years under the Alien Tort Claims Act, which was not in the uh, business advisory, but it's something you should be mindful of as well, um, for allegedly benefiting from forced labor in their supply chain. And that is um, currently set to be heard by the Supreme Court. So many um, avenues for liability enforcement under US law, in addition to customs, which Lisa will go into in detail. Um, Scott, can you tell us about California? Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the California Trans Transparency and Supply Chain Act and a recent forced labor law that also became fully implemented in, in 2020. So the, the California Transparency and Supply Chain Act uh, basically is a California law that's been around now for a few years, but it does require on a website for any company that does business in California, has annual worldwide gross receipts exceeding $100 million, uh, or if no website, then in writing and accessible to consumers to disclose certain things that, that basically verify, uh, well, uh, verify whether or not they, they, their product supply chains evaluate and address risks of human trafficking and slavery, uh, whether or not they conduct audits of suppliers to evaluate supplier compliance. Uh, they require suppliers to certify that the materials incorporated into the product comply with, with the laws regarding slavery and human trafficking, whether or not that is uh, the organization doing business in California does that? Um, do they maintain internal accountability standards and procedures uh, for employees or contractors that fail to meet those standards? Uh, and also, do they provide company employees and management or those with direct responsibility uh, with training on this subject? And also with respect to some of the verifications, um, you're also required to indicate whether or not the verification is done by a third party. And non-compliance, uh, in effect, could mean or result in a directive that you can't do business in the state of California. And then in ramping that up a little bit further to show sort of where this is going and, and why uh, what we're talking about is becoming more and more relevant is also hotels and motels in California now effective in 2020, particularly given the, the, the concept that there's forced labor that may be coming across our borders are supposed to require awareness training and education for each employee likely to interact or come in come into contact with victims of human trafficking um, either with, within six months of his his or her employment and then every two years um, and while this 
you know, we're not going to cover everything in these particular slides. Um, but what's interesting about the definitional section is basically the employee that may come into contact with somebody engaging in human trafficking is defined as anybody that may interact with somebody in the public. Um, so it's a pretty pretty broad definition. So we have the California Trans Transparency and Supply Chains Act, and then we have this ramp up of forced labor law that, that came into effect for the hotel and motel sector specifically uh, in 2020. Uh, next slide. Uh, the other thing that I'm going to briefly talk about uh, while we have this conversation is is the USMCA, and uh, that came into effect uh, effective July 1 of 2020. There, it's it's a long statute. Um, it certainly covers more than labor. Um, there's some environmental components, some other components to it. I'm going to focus on the on the labor provisions uh, for the slides that I'm going to be focusing on, and from the from the labor principles. Um, and the USMCA that went into effect on July 1 of 2020, that in effect replaces NAFTA. Um, and some of the labor principles that are there, um, and probably the most significant part of it is, is the enforcement mechanisms that are within the USMCA, because certainly we've had laws on the books that, that, that deal with compulsory labor and child labor, but the USMCA, unlike NAFTA, pr provides the enforcement mechanisms. And so what does it say from the labor principle side? It, it eliminates um, compulsory labor and child labor uh, from, from, a, from that perspective, or that's the, the intent of it. Uh, it also has provisions within it as well that, that is to ensure acceptable conditions of work with respect to minimum wages, hours of work, and safety and health, um, and also provides or has provisions regarding collective bargaining. Um, one of the, you know, one of the interesting or, or key components of this, for example, is by 2023, 40% um, or more of certain components of auto parts must be supplied by individuals that make at least 16 bucks an hour. Um, and, and so then, then there's the enforcement aspect of it, knowing, and from this aspect, and what's key about the enforcement aspect with respect to U.S., Mexico, and Canada, uh, that's, that's the USMCA, um, is it then provides remedies um, from a trade perspective um, if there is a non-compliance by in particular, the focus candidly is on Mexico more so than than on Canada. And so there, there is. I'm going to be focusing on on the arrangement between the U.S. and Mexico as opposed to Canada and Mexico. But, but, but uh, next slide. What what is what is formed with respect to that is a rapid response labor mechanism, where in essence, um, if there is a view that labor principles that are required by the USMCA are not being complied with, there's basically a panel that would be sort of akin, uh, for those of us that, that, are, that, that are lawyers and, and do this on a regular basis, it, it's gonna basically proceed similar to an arbitration panel um, where Mexico and each, and the United States, each party shall, shall appoint either, they'll either comprise three, three individuals or five individuals that will be on this panel. Um, one will be chosen by Mexico. If it's a three person, one will be chosen by the United States. And then by consensus, uh, another individual from the list. Um, th there's a required that the label panelists be appropriately qualified, which by definition means that they have some experience and expertise with respect to labor law matters or labor matters generally and not just a somebody without any any of that sort of experience um, and then next slide <clears throat> and then in terms of what this response panel can do is if there is a feeling and, and sort of what the the point of it is um, and some of the components that are that are part of it that that are not necessarily or not specifically addressed on the slides but but there there are requirements for example in mexico that they have 
a, a labor court, that they, they enact laws that govern minimum wage and, and safety that's generally in compliance with and consistent with what we would be um, experiencing in the United States from the Fair Labor, labor Standards Act um, and our, our work requirements. Um, there, there's also going to be a hotline that's going to be set up as well uh, for for individuals to call in and and make their their grievances, and this could be either by workers um, or certainly by aggrieved parties. And then the idea behind the rapid response labor mechanism panel is if there is a finding that, for example, a a company in you know a, a one a particular company in theory it could be in the United States, but we we certainly have our laws that that are independent from the USMCA that sort of govern our our wage laws. But but the idea is if if there is a company that is not doing or or playing by the book in terms of having fair safety standards, um, paying individuals correctly, uh, violating forced labor principles, um, that basically you can go to a hearing, uh, you would present your case, um, and this panel then could could in essence uh, issue determinations regarding tariffs. On, on goods, uh, they they could impose penalties that would enjoin the goods from coming into the U.S. Um, from the U.S. side, just so that you're aware, um, it, it is will be in concert with the U.S. Department of Treasury and with Congress. So there there is some coordination with with in terms of how that all works, um, but but it is a pretty significant add-in in terms of of uh, attempting to control uh, forced labor and, and provide a fair a fair playing field. And I think uh, the, the next slides are going to be covered by Lisa. Yes, um, I just wanted to jump in because I did not mention early on that if you have any questions, you can go to the panel box and type it in under questions and we'll keep track of those. If we can, we'll try to answer them during the presentation. Um, if it fits in, and if not, we will have time for question and answer at the end of the panel. Um, but just wanted to make sure you all were aware. You can feel free to put your questions in now if you'd like to do so. Thank you, Lisa. Great. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, good. So, um, yes, I'm going to talk about um, how, the, how the U.S. government is involved as a backdrop to all this. So if you can go to the next slide. Uh, many of you are probably used to working with uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, which, as you know, after 9-11 is now part of Department of Homeland Security. And so as a, a member of the COAC, which is an advisory board um, to CBP, we also do work with DHS and many different uh, partner government agencies and um, really wanted to stress how this is coming down, you know, uh, from the highest levels, um, really from the Trump administration, uh, he has passed several executive orders um, focusing on human trafficking and forced labor. So there's been a, a very big push for enforcement. And as you can see here, um, DHS has their blue campaign, which we like to talk, of, you know, call if, if you see something, say something. They've done a lot to uh, put this in airports and, and other areas. And um, I've given here a link to a, a, a short video that they've put together. It's very easy to talk about this in under five minutes if you need to share that with everybody. But just some statistics here for you. I mean, when we look at forced labor as an industry, um, we hear that it's 150 billion industry or more. That's second only to the drug trade. And many of you are familiar of how aggressive CBP is enforcing drugs across the borders and coming in. So um, this is second only to that. It's it's considered you know, these are violative goods considered criminal activity. And so it does get a lot of attention um, throughout the organization. CBP as the enforcer who you may interact with the most also works with ICE, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, as well as Homeland Security Investigations, which is the criminal um, side of things where they could refer cases or where they'll often go to other countries to investigate some of these forced labor matters um, as they look at some of these withhold release orders that we'll talk about. So just some quick statistics. Um, people always think, well, it could not possibly happen here in the U.S., but yes, maybe it, it, it is a global issue. Of course, China is a big focus right now, but we have over 1.5 million of these incidents right here in the U.S., right in our backyard. And just to drive this home, as part of the DHS Blue Campaign, 
I live in Bartlett, which is just a small uh, suburb of Chicago, and I have a 14-year-old son, so I'm very passionate about this topic. And just at our local church where he made, you know, his, uh, made his communion, um, they held a, a whole presentation about this because they said just in our area alone, there were hundreds and thousands or hundred thousands of children who were subject to this through social media. My son is the perfect target for that age. It's not just young girls, it's, you know, young boys, all of them recruited for criminal activity. And um, in many cases, not just sex trafficking, but forced labor. In fact, that's 80% of, of what's, um, what's being involved in these situations. So the DHS line alone has gotten over 40,000 calls in the last year. It's helped over 10,000 uh, incidences of human trafficking. And I'm a bit of a trade junkie when it comes to these. I see reports every day of arrests being made here right on our soil. Uh, so it's glad, you know, good to see this um, coming to fruition. But if we go to the next slide, um, you'll see that a CBP, while they are in the enforcer, they really have to rely on the information that they get from the Department of Labor. They are the ones who put the list together. Um, I believe in September of 2020, this uh, list was just updated where you could go to this link that I gave you and download it in a spreadsheet. There are 150 five different goods from 77 different countries. So as an importer, how do you, you know, manage this through risk mapping? Uh, I have, my husband is a small importer and I think uh, earlier in the presentation, you talked about Australia has a revenue kind of level of participation. Well, here in the US, there is no level. Every importer who brings goods into the US needs to be mindful of these laws, no matter how big or small you are. Um, and you need to be uh, aware of these tools so that you can download them. On the next slide, um, what my favorite is really the sweat, what we call the sweat and toil app. You can go into your phone. I'm a very visual person, but um, I don't know if you could see this, but if um, you go right into your phone in your iPhone app, you, dial, you put in sweat and toil and you get this great app and right at your fingertips, it's gonna show you the goods, the countries, you can go into a country, it's gonna show you what goods are made with forced labor. It's an easy way for an importer to identify, do I even have an issue? You may not even bring a commodity um, into the co uh, country or maybe you bring in the commodity, but it's not from a country of concern. Uh, for example, my husband as a small importer was bringing in towels from India. Well, when I started looking it, into this for him, cotton from India is a problem. So he had to really dig into his supply chain to figure out you know, what was going on there. And every importer really needs to do that if, if they find a commodity from a certain country on this list. So if we can go to the next slide, um, we can talk about why is CBP paying attention to this now? Because um, as Gabriella mentioned, these laws have been on the books for a very long time. Well, as many of you uh, importers know, or customs brokers who are on this call, uh, the Trade Facilitation Trade Enforcement Act was passed by Congress in February of 2016. And a big provision of that was forced labor and implementing more enforcement on um, forced labor laws. So it took CBP a little bit of uh, time to get around their arms around it, but they've been much more aggressive in this area. And if we can go to the next slide, um, you'll know that CBP has its own laws and um, 19 USC 1307 defines this very much matches what the IOL, ILO um, also stipulates. But uh, for any importer, you really have to go to customs laws and regulations. That's what's going to dictate their policy on how they're going to handle uh, shipments of forced labor coming into the country, how they define it, right? And uh, important to note that when they say wholly or in part. So as I mentioned with my husband, he's bringing in towels. Well, he has to dig deep into his supply chain to figure out the cotton in those towels. If you're a wine distributor, uh, you need to go as deep as looking at, you know, the grapes going into that wine, right? So for many importers, this is a challenge because they are used to maybe looking at tier one or tier two in their supply chain, but you may need to dig deeper for that when it comes to forced labor to really understand the problem and what CBP is looking for under the laws. Uh, so the next uh, slide, what happened was in those laws, um, because of TIFTIA, we, uh, CBP took action to repeal the consumptive demand clause. 
So the reality is that here in the US, um, even if goods were made with forced labor, you could get around it by saying, well, we don't have those goods here in the US, we have to import them. That was removed. And that's why now CBP um, has full authority to enforce these cases. Uh, there is no uh, consumptive demand clause any longer. And um, if you look at, again, this uh, fact sheet, it will it'll detail all that and how the law was, was changed to accommodate that. So in the next slide, um, you also have to be aware of the North Korea Sanction Act. This is also a similar provision, uh, which I can give you a little bit of detail on. Uh, I just want to read from it exactly. These are sanctions for any goods produced in whole or in part by North Korean convict or forced labor and for persons that employ North Korean forced laborers. Now, um, for many people, the problem is really because of the exportation of North Korean workers and uh, for importers, how do they control that in their supply chain? Uh, this is especially an issue in China or transship areas. They have also mentioned that Russia, Nigeria, Middle Eastern countries. Um, so you do have to be mindful of these areas that are working with North Korea uh, forced labor because you could be some subject to sanctions. Just in January of this year, there were uh, two uh, Korean entities uh, that were fined for this. Their assets were frozen. Um, American companies could no longer do business with them. So this is another element of the forced labor laws. Next slide. Lisa, I was just going to interject that um, it's worth noting with North Korea that there is a presumption that anything made from North Korean labor, including outside of the United States, is forced labor. So, right. Yes, thank you for that clarification. Um, so what I mentioned is how I'm a member of the forced labor working group uh, with uh, CBP in, in, in the COAC role. And so what I just wanted to mention here is that uh, working group has over 50 different members. In fact, we have a member from the USCIB that uh, Gabriella has talked about. Uh, we have members from CBP and uh, DHS, as well as ICE, uh, talked about all the different government agencies, this whole of government approach, the State Department, um, the Department of Labor. We also have importers, customs brokers, and an, another uh, key component is the what we call the NGOs or the third, you know, kind of the uh, nonprofits. There's many of them who are involved in combating human trafficking and bringing to light these issues. And in fact, they are often the ones who will uh, submit cases through uh, to CBP through their e-allegations. There's many different ways they can submit these instances and that's where CBP will look at investigating some of these forced labor matters. And so I give a link to uh, some of the recommendations that the COAC has made um, because it gives uh, links to a lot of great information that may be beneficial to you, not only from what was in this presentation, but even more on managing your supply chain. Uh, next slide. So if I could say anything to you uh, outside of getting the Sweat and Toil app, please make sure that you are signing yourself up for messages from CBP's forced labor page. You can see at the very top of this page, you can get email updates. Um, if you go there, you can provide your email to get CSM, what they call CSM messaging. And anytime there are updates made to this page or a withhold and release order issued by CBP, you can get an email sent to you. And that is a great way of trying to keep up with this because uh, these are heating up quite a bit. I also give a link uh, to this page where you'll find a wealth of information. The next slide will show you um, how there's uh, these articles on forced labor enforcements. It'll go through how they handle withhold release orders, detain shipments, uh, those details. Next slide. Uh, there's also some uh, good slides or information about your supply chain. I think there's about 10 different documents. These were all uh, from the Forced Labor Working Group. There's also a Q&A. And you can also look at um, sending an email if you want to write this down. You can go to trade.enforcement at cbp.dhs.gov. And you can send all sorts of questions uh, to the uh, CBP directly. They have an FAQ online and they will also answer your questions directly. Um, so then if we can go into then the withhold release order here, I just wanted to talk about this process because what will happen is once a withhold release order is issued, uh, that's when CBP will detain any goods from coming into the US. 
And uh, many importers will not always know about it because it's going to be commodity specific, country specific, and also the shipper manufacturer specific. So uh, you could have goods on the water uh, or here uh, getting ready to be delivered to you and all of a sudden a WRO is issued and your goods are going to get stopped, detained, uh, could possibly be asked to be re-delivered re to CBP's custom custody because at this point in the process, uh, they feel those goods are made with forced, forced, labor, forced labor and they've initiated an investigation to do so. So that's the, the WRO process. Uh, next slide, please. So where you can go, um, uh, this link on CBP's website is where you can see all of the active um, W or, or what I call the WROs. Right now, um, actually in China, this number is, has even gone up. There's now 29 active cases from China. There's actually about, I think 40 or 41 total active WROs. Most of these, there's just one from a specific country I've listed here, and then China has many different ones. You'd have to go online and look at all of them. But um, like I said, you, sh you should be checking this often. You should also try to set up for the messaging from uh, the CSM messaging that I mentioned, so you would know as soon as an order is issued. You can also check for some of you who are doing um, denied party screening. Sometimes your software provider for that process will also have active WROs and you can maybe get that through um, your feed as well. So if we can go through the next slide. Uh, what happens is if a WRO um, is found to be conclusive, uh, CBP can issue a finding. Um, and there are also instances where they would revoke a WRO or revoke a finding um, if they've investigated and found that there is no forced labor that exists or has been resolved. There are some cases where uh, things do get resolved, but um, the main issue you need to know is uh, once a WRO is issued, you have three months to, to either prove to CBP that it wasn't made with forced um, labor. And I know you're gonna talk about that further in the pres presentation, or you need to export it because it can't come into the country. And if you don't, uh, CBP is, is going to seize those goods. So I think in our next, uh, we only have about five active finding now, uh, findings now, but this next slide is going to go into detail about the process. Uh, you can find this map uh, on CBP's website. But as I mentioned, what will often happen, uh, CBP has a tip that'll come in through that DHS line. Uh, they have e-allegations on their website where people can you know, formally put forth an uh, e-allegation. We've talked about in the forced labor working group trying to build a mobile app because most people who are caught in forced labor situations aren't, you know, don't have computers, don't have phones, but can sometimes get to an iPhone and maybe uh, submit something. So it starts with the, uh, you know, the allegation. And now after TIFTIA, CBP has what they call a trade, kind of a, a trade enforcement director division where um, I gave you the email address where all these investigations go to be reviewed. And so they would then look at that, um, decide if it, uh, if it is made with forced labor or if they feel it is, uh, approve the WRO and kind of go um, through this process that I talked about. Um, so next slide. So um, people ask, well, what can I do? What can I do to protect myself from these forced labor situations if I do have commodities from these countries um, that the Department of Labor puts out? Uh, you can consider a binding ruling. I know it's unusual. You probably think of that for maybe classification, a country of origin issues, but it is acceptable for forced labor. Maybe you're thinking of uh, a new supply, a new commodity that you're bringing in and you wanna give details to CBP to kind of bless it. You can go through the binding ruling process to do that. Uh, next slide. Uh, Lisa, I just wanted to just make another comment. Um, yeah. The list of industries and, and products that are um, at great, you know, higher risk for forced labor is not an exclusive list. Those would be the ones that you need to look at to really make sure that, you know, you're doing your diligence, you're kind of on notice that there is a significantly increased risk of forced labor, but CBP could block any goods. Correct. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the WROs are the most current ones that 
an, you know, an importer needs to be aware of because their goods are going to be detained, right, if that happens. But uh, any goods that are on uh, the Department of Labor list is something that CBP could be targeting. And it's usually, like I said, based on tips that come in or, or areas where they think, uh, you know, they, they have the ability to know we're starting to see, you know, uh, um, these types of goods coming in. We see this with anti-dumping when a certain, a new case comes, you know, they're trying to uh, transship goods right through, through CBP. So they have many different ways that they can target these areas. They do know the goods, they know the countries they're coming from if they ever need to, to look at that in some way. And I think I talk about that a little bit uh, later with their 28 requests which may be on the next slide, I'm not sure. <laughs> yes, okay, so great segue into this is uh, really if uh, CBP is starting to feel like uh, there could be some forced labor concerns, certain commodities, certain countries, they will typically make uh, a 28 request. Uh, this is a form that'll go out to uh, an importer where they are looking for information. And uh, sometimes they can be quite intense when it comes to forced labor because as CBP will say, it's on you. It's harder for them to enforce forced labor because they can't just get a container, open it up, look at it, and say, "Oh yeah, these are made with forced labor," like they can with, say, intellectual property property rights or smuggling of goods coming in, or maybe, uh, you know, valuation issues. It takes a lot more investigation for them to know if if goods are made with forced labor. So they will often make 28 requests to gather information about an importer. Uh, your your compliance program, your supply chain, ask a lot of detailed questions. I give a link to a COAC paper we did because we've been giving feedback on what types of questions they should be asking that would be more meaningful to an importer. They've been listening to us about that. If you take a look at this link, you'll see what kind of information uh, CBP will often, often be asking in a 28 request. And so then the next slide would be if they get a 28 uh, request and they think they, you know, they need to audit you, um, maybe they haven't made a 28 request or not, it, it depends, but this is usually the next step is uh, they may send you a letter like this, which would request um, an audit of, um, of your entire operation and what they'll be looking for in your operation. I think if you click again, there's this next slide, um, next section. So this was just, a, this is a real letter that has gone out. So you could see if you got a letter like this from CBP, uh, what they'd be looking for in an audit. And I believe the next slides will be talking about how, how you can address that. And the only last comment I will make is that uh, with CBP, look forward to next year, um, their trusted trader pilot, which is for many of the importers on this call, I know, and, and customs brokers are already CTPAT members. You can also become um, former what was called ISA members are now trade compliance members and under the trade compliance program you'll be able to apply for uh, forced labor and I would certainly encourage many of you to take a look at what that program is. I gave a link to it and what's forthcoming next year to get some protection uh, in this area that you're used to where you could perhaps do prior disclosures, try to mitigate these instances mitigate uh, penalties that could be assessed against you for forced labor in those types of situations. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. And we're having, um, I need to get the PowerPoint back up. So give us a second there. I will use that moment to reiterate that if you have a question, please type it into the question box <coughs> and we will address it. But now we've got our PowerPoint back. <clears throat> so uh, in the next uh, 10 minutes, I'm going to quickly talk about compliance strategies for companies. And then we will, you know, th again, throw it open to, to questions. This is going to be a high level discussion because we just don't have the time to, to really get into the weeds. But I want to start with some fundamental questions that you should be asking yourself. And, and as Lisa mentioned, you know, do you know where your goods are made? That's sort of a, a basic question. Um, do you know where the material that is going into those goods um, is coming from? Do you know what industries and regions pose elevated risks in your supply chain? This is going to be where you want to focus. Um, 
most of your resources. It's not the only place to focus resources, but you want to look at like these DOL reports and figure out where your higher risk um, products are coming from. And do your key employees understand red flags for child and forced labor? Now, who are your key employees? Um, obviously, in the hotel example, it's the you know people who are working in the hotel and interacting with the public. Um, if you're a manufacturing company, it might be your quality or procurement um, personnel who go out and visit suppliers, and they're the ones who actually see the people working in the um, in the factories or in in the um, you know production facilities. So, so those are the key employees who really can um, can have understanding red flags, as well as your logistics and your import personnel who are, are familiar with the CBP um, metrics. With sort of those questions in mind, um, I, I want to circle back to the point that it's, it's important to really think about this as a global compliance strategy and not rely on ad hoc issue spotting. Um, it's much better to be in a position where you've put some procedures in place to ask the appropriate questions, um, do the diligence where you know risk-based assessment calls for it, instead of sort of presuming that you'll identify the circumstance where you've got a you know forced labor issue, like it'll just you know know it when you see it kind of problem. Um, that 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 really is not an effective strategy. Um, also, um, a link here that, we, that we've shared is to the reasonable care checklist, and it's important that CBP included forced labor in 2017 on the reasonable care checklist. That's, one, that, that's basically the requirement for the liability standards for importers. You have to take reasonable care um, on various ways, including uh, forced labor management. And then, I pressed a button, hold on. Okay. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about how forced labor in this legal context dovetails with the corporate social responsibility initiatives. Um, and in particular, you might've heard the phrase social compliance system that really is sort of the human resources subset of the corporate social responsibility initiatives. CSR might cover environmental issues um, as well, but the human resources component really aligns quite a bit with um, what you want to be doing to make sure that you're in compliance with all these forced labor laws. And I think that if there are different people at a company who are handling, for example, customs compliance or um, trade compliance generally, and, or even you know, human resources, sort of labor compliance, and then the corporate social responsibility person is someone else, you should all really talk to each other so that you are working in harmony. I, I've sometimes seen um, companies where a lot of resources maybe get thrown at CSR, and so they have some great systems to send out checklists and questionnaires and training, but if they don't know what your risks are for your company that like this, the customs um, people have identified, they may not drill into everything that you would like to drill into. I mean, they, they might be sending out questionnaires. If they added a couple of questions, you would have everything you would want. So I just put a plug in for everyone talking together. This is another um, helpful resource on the Department of Labor's website. If you haven't picked up on the theme, there's actually a lot of really great resources that the government has put out to help you understand these issues and help you come up with um, procedures and help you figure out where your higher risks are. This here talks about a social compliance system. And if you go to the website, you can click on each link and it kind of helps you walk through step by step building a um, compliance program around forced labor. Um, how, how to figure out who the stakeholders are in your company and externally, how to sort of figure out where your risk is, develop your code of conduct, which is an essential um, piece for compliance with many of the laws that we talked about early on, um, how to communicate and train, how to monitor compliance of both your company and your suppliers. Um, so often, you know, 
in the California law, if we flipped back to it, you would see requirements that you flow down to suppliers. And there was a question, which I don't believe is a requirement, but a question, do you audit them? Like you flow down these, you know, um, you, you flow down these requirements, are you auditing them? You have to disclose if you audit them. Um, so what does that mean? That's basically the monitoring piece, as well as the independent review piece. And, and what makes sense for your company and the type of business that you have. Um, for some companies with a lot of risk and a lot of resources, you know, engaging with independent monitors really makes a lot of sense. Um, for smaller companies with maybe only a few suppliers, you know, you might use internal resources uh, as long as they've got training. And just, you know, just really look at the company. Anyone want to throw anything in before I move on to the next slide? I'm mindful of the time, but um, if any other panelists... Like to emphasize the points um, that you made about having a comprehensive strategy in place and good communication across business units. The position you don't want to be in is the ad hoc uh, kind of uh, approach that you described and then be caught flat-footed. This is very clear from what you described, the expectations which we kicked off at the beginning in terms of societal expectations for business are always evolving and there's a real clear sense and a business understanding as well about the positive role and that means taking steps to um, operate with due diligence um, in order to um, meet business targets and business objectives and also do so in a way that's respecting um, human rights and labor rights. So. Um, the strategy and the cross-discipline approach uh, were very important points. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Gabriella. I would just add too, from CBP's standpoint, once you get a 28 request, or if you're an importer, at any, and they're asking you about, you know, forced labor, if you don't have a compliance system or corporate social responsibility, pro, you know, program, that's going to be a bit of a problem, right? Because that's going to be their first question. Anyway. Yes. Always good to start proactively and um, make sure you engage people from different parts of the organization. Um, and then I wanted to dig in a little bit on third party vetting and management because that's sort of the risk area that we're focusing on in this, this presentation. There, there is other types of forced labor risk, including involved in your own operations. But um, when you're looking at suppliers, there are a number of organizations that are um, industry-based that you can look at as resources, consider joining. Um, I actually don't have a link here, but back to the Department of Labor you know, website, they, they have a number of these different organizations listed. And that can be a really good um, platform for collectively um, vetting suppliers. Um, sometimes they, they have sort of third parties who, who will audit suppliers and like certify them and that can be can be really useful but i would say that it shouldn't take the place of your own risk assessment um you you still want to be thinking okay is this industry organization fully aligned with my risks or are there suppliers um or issues that they haven't you know really addressed because it's not core to everyone um there's also you know this this is a sample um, questionnaire, thank you, Lisa, that I, I, I've thrown up on here. Um, and there's also the possibility of sending your own questionnaires out, incorporating these questionnaires, um, again, with either the procurement team practice, with the quality team, with the compliance team, but you know, on the front end, doing your own deep dive into suppliers. Um, and, and this may not be every supplier. I mean, if you have a supplier of, um, you know, the, the person who does the catering for your, your offices doesn't necessarily need to be the one that you focus all of your resources in. Um, the, the, the parties that are supplying um, key components to your products are probably the ones that you want to focus your resources towards. But um, you also want to make sure you're including all the appropriate contractual terms or certifications. Again, many of these laws require you to flow down these provisions. So take a look at your T's and C's, and you want to make sure you're educating your suppliers on your code of conduct. Um, once you've developed your code of conduct around forced labor, make sure that they understand that this is something that, you know, is serious and that you're not tolerating. Um, 
Okay, and um, I, I'm just going to throw this up here so you, you can see a little flavor. This is like, you know, page one and four of, I don't know, 20 pages. <laughs> a lot of audit questions that you will get if you do face a forced labor audit for CPP. I would say in, in the building of your compliance program, I wouldn't necessarily start here. I would start back at the beginning with looking at your risk, um, looking at your industries, starting to put in place something that makes sense for you, meets your um, you know, uh, legal requirements, and then use this as a tool to go back and kind of assess your compliance program. Okay, we've, we've got what we think makes sense, but have we considered these questions? Um, and occasionally, you know, there might be an audit question that you legitimately might say, no, I don't do X, Y, Z. And you might have a, you know, a real reason that that makes sense for your business. Um, so you shouldn't look at this uh, questionnaire as a must have, but as um, something as a gut check, really. Like when you're faced with these questions, do you have good responses? And then record keeping, um, just sort of last point in your compliance program. Do you have a reliable procedure that maintains custom entry documentation and supporting information? And in particular, if you're dealing with um, high risk goods, do you have something that documents you know, the diligence that you've done related to forced labor? Um, are you, do, do you have a record keeping system in place to make sure that you're appropriately filling out all these reporting forms required by the non-US statutes. I mean, if you're operating globally, you may need to file um, in many different jurisdictions, different reports or disclosures on forced labor. And, you know, again, keeping track of the diligence that you've done, the steps you've taken, the training that you've under you, you've, you've um, put in place for your employees and suppliers is important if you ever find yourself facing a lawsuit um, as well. So that is sort of the, the big picture. Um, I'd like to move to questions. We'll, keep, we'll stay open for a little bit, but before we do, I will read the CLE code. Um, if you're seeking CLE for today's program, the tracking code is N-O-V-C-L-E. That's N-O-V-C-L-E. Okay, and we'll throw this open to questions. Um, Scott, do you want to throw any out there or should I, I uh, share one that I have? Uh, th there was one one question that that did come in uh, and and I and I don't know if anybody on the panel has, has sort of a comment on it, but the question was we we ban products uh, internationally uh, from forced labor from prisons. Um, but what about the, the the use of prison labor in in our country? And does anybody have a have an opinion or view view on that? And and I think maybe I'll add to that. Do you see any countries banning products of prison labor that might you know capture U.S. based production? Yeah. Um, well, I, oh well. Go I, ahead, Gabriela. Yeah. Um, Lisa, you're you're the one who can answer this last bit about the banning. Well, I, I was just going to say, I mean, we do get this question often. Um, and obviously here in the US, while we do have prison labor and we do use them, they actually do get paid, um, maybe not what normally would be. And they certainly um, aren't forced against their will, like what we saw uh, with the drone images of, you know, forced labor in China, right, with uh, people who are blindfolded and brought on train cars. So, you know, I, I think there's a distinct uh, difference. And I would also add that much of the forced labor um, out there is very much against uh, the people's will and also very much um, underage children, right, who aren't protected. So that's why I do think um, it, it's quite different what we're looking at from an enforcement or what CBP is looking at from an enforcement standpoint. I don't know, Gabrielle, if you had more to add. Just um, I might combine it with a, a, an additional emphasis that, um, you know, it's true, we do have um, prison labor in this country, and as you described, it is regulated. Um, and I think the bar always needs to be raised everywhere when addressing the types of issues that we've been describing today. Um, and the ILO has some very clear definitions, um, and um, those are reflected um, in what we've emphasized today and in the programs we've emphasized. Um, the, types of issues that we're describing today um, 
and the increasing focus on the role of business is because there's a lot of frustration on the fact that governments around the world aren't enforcing the national labor laws and gaps are being created. And in the absence of that, people increasingly are looking to see the role that business, especially global corporations can be playing. Um, but the deep rooted nature of a lot of these practices around the world, as I mentioned with poverty or wide scale informal economy sectors really does require a joined up effort um, with stakeholders, with business, with governments, um, the host governments and um, the developed governments and as well as the civil society organizations if we're really going to be able to make a dent in this. But this is committed and focused and we do see um, um, increasing regulation in this space as well and we follow it with great interest and um, continue to support the global fight. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I would echo what, what Lisa and Gabriella said about, about the prison labor and the forced labor and would also add generally from a, from a U.S. standpoint and that it being regulated, regulated is that from the U.S. standpoint, the, the prison labor would not be technically forced. In other words, if somebody doesn't want to do it, they don't have to do it. And we have that similar concept with respect to interns and, and certain certain levels of tasks in terms of or, or arrangements in terms of how they how they are going to be compensated, and so uh, you know the, the prison labor in the U.S. they are paid, perhaps not at the same standards as somebody who's not in prison. On the other hand, uh, you know I think the argument would be that they have room and board, and it is not it is not required. Um, and, and I think that's sort of echoing what Gabriella and Lisa said, but and just from my standpoint as a as a labor lawyer who defends Fair Labor Standard Act claims, unpaid wage claims, defending them right now in federal court, that, that that would be probably a distinguishing, a big distinguishing thing in terms of comparing what we have in terms of other countries and the forced prison labor. So I have another question about whether anyone sees changes in the enforcement of uh, forced labor standards under a Biden administration? I, I would just say, I mean, not necessarily with regards to enforcement, but just focus on the issue overall and, and um, activity on the part of our government across the, uh, many of the different branches that you've described, like DOL and DHS or um, USTR or state, et cetera. Um, this remains a priority issue. It's a global fight um, and from the ILO on down, um, employers around the world, workers and governments. And so I do not expect um, that there will be, um, well, I, I expect that there will still be a continued focus as there should be on finding ways to understand and effectively address um, the root uh, of these issues. Yeah, I, I think it will um, continue to be a more and more prominent issue. Um, we've, you know, like the USMCA mechanism only just got started. Um, a number of these global laws are are just coming into effectiveness recently, and, and some of them don't have enforcement teeth yet, but but will. So I, I agree that I think it will continue to be a prominent issue. And um, yeah, no, 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 no change of direction. <laughs> um, any last questions before we we sign off? I'm heartened to see the very uh, strong attendance that uh, Thompson Hein you were able to garner for today's training. It's it's the right topic be discussed and I'm I'm very proud to have been able to be a part of it. Kudos to you and your organization for this initiative. And um, I'm I'm hopeful that those who listened were are able to take action and 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 follow up with any questions. Thank you very much, Gabriella. And um, I, before we go, I will mention that our, our next webinar is going to be December 16th with Zong Lun Law Firm discuss, discussing the new China export control law.
So um, for those trained compliance professionals on there, you know, I hope you can join us for that one. But again, thank you very much, Gabriella and Lisa, who I think is still here, but but whose camera made me just stop working. <laughs> and Scott, thank you all very much. And thank, thank you. you to our attendees. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.